they opened it. Their, the rationale on the website says if the packaging has been separated from the contents, we're going to need to know what the contents are so that we can identify them as yours. Hmm. And so I told him. Basically, he just took my stuff and said, hey, we've got some rules that we want to enforce, and if we take your stuff and use it, then it's going to make it easier for us. The world faces peak gold, according to Goldman Sachs. But one geologist who's discovered more than 30 million ounces of gold says he knows where to find America's hidden gold deposits. Featured on the History Channel's How the Earth Was Made, this expert gold finder could be on the verge of a massive gold strike. Even a billion dollar gold giant has engaged this small market cap company to use their proprietary technology. For the thrill of gold discovery, with a new edge in Nevada, visit crushthestreet.com gold. Hello, everyone, and welcome into CrushTheStreet.com. We got a libertarian talk today, Bitcoin talk. We're going to talk about freedoms and maybe have a little philosophical discussion. And we're going to do this with Dave Scotese. He's with Lipmocracy.blogspot.com. You can find him there. He's an expert on Bitcoin and freedom and liberty and it all relates he's a, a thinking guy he he really is someone who puts a lot of thought and who's wrapped his mind around a lot of concepts and i i hope to kind of extrapolate some of these things for everyone today i know it's going to be a great discussion first of all dave thanks for joining me today Oh, thanks for having me. I always like when you interview me. <laughs> Dave, thanks for coming on. Like I said, uh, I want to get an update with you on Bitcoin. Uh, we know that big news lately, you know, it, maybe it's a little older news for people who follow Bitcoin a lot, but Mike Hearn was the prominent leader uh, of the Bitcoin project, and he you know, the news is saying that he's been disillusioned with Bitcoin and he's thrown in the towel, calling it a failed experiment. Uh, should people be concerned about an insider from the Bitcoin community telling the world that Bitcoin is a failed experiment? Uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, but that's because I know a lot. I think it's more important to be concerned with understanding the issues than what particular individual. We run into a problem with anybody whose name gets famous. They basically, they get them and then feel that they're, they're making the same mistake that everybody else makes, which is to place more weight on the way they see things. Um, and I think, I, I don't want to... I mean, to be fair, know, though, this guy was part of the... The, the creators of Bitcoin, right? Sure. So, yeah. I mean, his weight is a little more credible than just some big name movie star coming out and saying Bitcoin is a bad idea. This is true. Uh, the things that I've, that mitigate that uh, added weight are his um, relationships with other institutions. And I don't know very many details, but to paint a broad picture from a faraway place where I can't see very well. He's got some business dealings with a large financial who might benefit from the reduction in importance of Bitcoin to, to everybody. And so there's a little bit of a bias there that I see. And then what happens, you know, he, he said, Oh, it failed and the price dropped and then it came back and, I I don't see how one person's judgments can. It's like saying it's like uh, what's the guy's name who runs Google? Sh Schmidt. I actually I don't know. Oh, well, whatever. If he comes out and he says, "Oh, emails failed because there's too much spam or whatever because of some problem with the Gmail spam bot whatever thing that 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 s splits it all up for us," because that thing does a great job, right? But if it identifies there's some problem with it, privacy or whatever, who knows. And then he comes down and says, oh, email is a failed system and whatever. I mean, <laughs> Dave, I that, that's actually a really good illustration. Um, but for, so let's say, someone who doesn't understand Bitcoin, I mean, is that the comparison? Is it something simple like that that he's kind of reflecting on and saying, hey, Bitcoin has this issue and it can be compared to, to that example? Um. Yes and no. So in my example, you made me realize my example is pretty good because spam is a problem with email um, and people are 
uh, inventing solutions to that problem all the time. Well, if the CEO of Google comes out and says that problem is it's destroying email, so we, you know we need to move on to some other system. Um, you know, people can take that as as they will. Uh, in the case of what Mike Hearn's talking about is the way that we handle the um, limit of Bitcoin and, you know, how many transactions it can handle. We want it to handle more. His proposal would, his proposal with Gavin, which was Bitcoin XT, would um, double that or multiply it by four, I can't remember. It would make it go up really fast. And it was too fast for a lot of people. And the arguments that people of planet Earth have these days about controversial issues that are important uh, morph into basically yelling matches which are full of emotion and censorship and people getting into stupid fights and it's ridiculous it's like why don't we have a philosophical discussion about this and say yeah Mike and Gavin your proposal is a little too fast why don't we slow it down and and they were trying then there were people having those discussions but listen to the chorus the crowd the masses and they're all getting emotional and hyper and oh Bitcoin's destroyed and then you know one of the one of the philosophical discussers, Mike, uh, gets involved for, and for some reason decides to go that way. So it's, it's just, this is all crap, let's not use it. And to be fair, if it really was something people were extremely scared about, we probably would have seen Bitcoin fall a lot further than it did. I mean, it just fell under the $400 mark and not that many months ago. I mean, it was in the $100 range, right? Yeah. You got it. So is there just a large base of people that are just holding on to it? Is that, and, you know, this this base will only continue to grow? There's a, a from, well, as I see it, I mean, nobody can know that without doing lots of polls, I mean, for empirical evidence. But my thinking and my guess is that you're right. There's lots of people who are interested in Bitcoin and uh, 5, 10% of the herd heard of Mike Kern, they don't care, they just use Bitcoin and it works for them and so they buy it and or, or they sell it, whatever it is they use it for. Um, and so yeah, there's that that hidden group um, that hasn't even heard of it. And then there's another hidden group that never speaks up and just says, oh yeah, Bitcoin goes up and Bitcoin dies and Bitcoin comes back and it, you know, it hasn't hurt me yet so I'm, I'm sticking with it. And then the price comes back because those people are there. So, Dave, let's move on. I wanted to talk about uh, a, a recent issue that you've had with the government. You've told me about this in private, and uh, I wanted to be able to have you on to share this with the audience and uh, your experiences with big government within your own life. Yeah, oh, that was uh, something that just happened in the last few weeks. One of my customers and I have a pretty trusting relationship, so he sends me a text message that says, "Hey, I need uh, you know this this dollar amount worth of Bitcoin," and I just say, "Okay," and I send it to him, and then he mails cash to me. Uh, so I get the tracking number, and then I look on the United States Postal Service website to track it. And this particular package, there was no movement. It went to a or origin facility is what it's called in Atlanta. And then it didn't move from there for several days. It still hasn't moved from there. So we started looking into it and asking them. He actually drove down to that facility and asked them about it a couple times, I think. Um, he didn't make any headway there. So uh, last week I went to their website, the U.S. Postal Service website, where you can file a claim for a lost package or whatever. And I filled that thing out, and a couple days later, I got a call from Joseph Bennett. Um, if anybody wants to Google him, he's got two N's and two T's in his last name. And in his call, he told me that they have my cash. Um, they took it because they're going to use it in a criminal investigation uh, involved with narcotic, narcotics. So they opened up the box. Oh, I don't know. And that's that's interesting because because yeah, how would they know what's in the box, right? Well, they would know because I'm in the claim that I filed online. I said what was in the box. I described the contents because if they opened their 
the rationale on the website says if the packaging has been separated from the contents, we're going to need to know what the contents are so that we can identify them as yours. Hmm. And so I told them. Okay. And then also I have a contact. Uh, I think he's an independent investigator that the post office hires sometimes. His name is Mike Dawson. And uh, he helped me with the previous package that was that was not addressed. Um, and ev it eventually got to me. So I had faith in them. And I said, yeah, um, I, I got in touch with Mike. And he said um, he would look into it. And then I just decided I better file the claim. So I did that. And, then, and so they knew what was in it. They knew it was cash. Um, and I don't know, maybe they did open it. Um, so... So you don't have it. What 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 are they doing with this package at the moment? I don't know. They they said they're going to send me some paperwork to explain what's going to happen next and all that. I haven't gotten that yet. So, so but you said that they're using it for an investigation. Yes, they. He Joseph Joe Bennett said it was a criminal narcotics investigation. They believe that that cash was used in. Uh, to facilitate a narcotics trade. And I said, well, I sold Bitcoin for it and I sent the Bitcoin to this address and, uh, you know, it's a Bitcoin address. Um, and the, so Joe asked me for a screenshot of my phone because the deal was made through text messaging. So I sent him that. And then he, uh, of course, first I asked if he minded if I could send and my customer said, yeah, that's no problem. Because I wouldn't send, you know, personal information like that without getting my customer's permission first. Um, so, so is it fair what they what they did considering they were trying to, they had an investigation out there that they were looking into? Well, I don't, I know that if, 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 you're, if you're a cop and you're chasing a bad guy and you're on foot and he hops on a motorcycle and, you know, you can commandeer somebody's car, is that fair? Well, it's up to the person who's driving the car, you know, do I want to let this car use my car? Oh, to get that bad guy? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. There. So in this case, you know, somebody's dealing in some nar narcotics. What do I care? I don't, I don't think that causes problems. I think that solves problems. So from my perspective, no, I don't think he should have done it. He just, basically, he just took my stuff and said, hey, we've got some rules that we want to enforce. And if we take your stuff and use it, then it's going to make it easier for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's what happened. I'm like, okay, fine. If you're going to do that, compensate me. Um, and I actually wrote Joe an email a couple of days ago saying that. You, you know, take the cash and do whatever you want with it, but send me a check or something so that I'm not out the value of that cash. I was supposed to have it a couple of weeks ago. Hmm. So, so do they, I mean, do they think that you and uh, the person you were transacting with is involved with this investigation? I mean, why would they are involved with the, the narcotics transaction. And, you know, if so, I, why would they compensate you if they're thinking that you might be involved with this illegal dealing? Uh, well, the easy answer to that is I'm innocent until proven guilty. So until they have some proof, uh, they shouldn't be taking my stuff. Now, what they want to, they want to make sure, if, you know, if there's evidence concerned with that currency, then, yeah, take the whole package open the thing up, you know, get whatever evidence you want. But in the meantime, send the value, you know, send a check or something to the person that the thing was addressed to. Yeah. And then if it turns out that that guy's guilty, then go after him then and do whatever you need to. Hmm. Yeah, but, uh, and it's, that, you know, that makes sense. Innocent till proven guilty. Why, right, exactly. why, why can they stop you mid-action without even knowing? Wow, so uh, is there... So at this point, you don't know if you're going to get your money back. Uh, well, I'm sure I will get it back. Uh, perhaps not the way that they want to give it back to me. But there's a, there's a jurisdictional, I don't know if that's the right word, uh, issue here, which is something hidden from most people. Uh, we're, we're human beings and we cooperate in order to live on this planet. And in light of that, we've developed court systems, which is basically saying, I have a dispute with this other guy, so we're going to go before the public and air out our differences. And the reason we go before the public is because that keeps us honest. And that's basically what a court system is for. And if you just look at the word court, we have tennis courts and basketball courts. These are arenas where the public can watch contenders. And in 
the view of the public, the contenders need to stay honest because otherwise the public is going to say, oh, yeah, we could see you're a schmuck. So we have the court system. And in that court system, uh, man has rights. Now, there's another term called person, and I'm taking, some of, I'm taking a lot of this from a guy named Carl Lentz, and he deserves credit because I learned it from him. Uh, you can Google him, Carl with a K, and then Lentz, L-E-N-T-Z. Um, so there's man, which is every, everybody's a man or a woman. And then there's persons. Well, persons are like disguises. They're clothing that we wear. So a driver is a person, a suspect is a person, et cetera. And you, the legal community can do stuff to persons because the, you know, those persons are they're acting in the capacity of whatever and the legal system deals with that whatever somehow. But a man has rights and property. I have property. And this other man, Joe, decided to take what was mine, my property, and do stuff with it. And so if I go through the court system correctly, it would be my court, and my court would say, I, this property is mine, and Joe took it, and he needs to give it back. And then I can take that before the public, and the public would say, well, yeah, Dave's got a good point, Joe, give him back his money. You know, and then he's bound. And they will try all sorts of legal mumbo-jumbo to get out of that, but that's a when I say jurisdictional issue, that's the key here is all that legal mumbo jumbo that's in person land. It's with lawyers and legalese and legalese is like this whole separate language that lawyers use to bamboozle the rest of us into saying, Oh yeah, we, you know, it makes us feel like slaves. Like they can tell us to do whatever they want and control us. And it's not true. When you recognize that you're, you're a man or a woman and you have rights, then and you're free. That's what this country is now. We're free since we kicked King George to the curb in 1776 or whenever it was. <laughs> well, moving on then, Dave, with the, the libertarian discussion, one of the things that we as libertarians or anarcho-capitalists believe is you know, ultimate liberty uh, from the government. And one of the topics that libertarians kind of can disagree on or, or just have a big discussion about is intellectual property. And these are things like patents, ideas, inventions, and things that could be extremely profitable. And I mean, when it's a physical piece of property, say a car or your money, if that's very tangible, you know that's yours. If someone comes and takes your car, there's a very clear this person took my stuff. But when it comes to intellectual property, like an idea and takes it and then creates a business based on the idea you started, there's a lot of gray area there. Um, what is your thoughts on whether or not intangible property, uh, intellectual property should be protected or not? Protected means what well protected from with what we have at the moment we have the government to protect us we don't have a free market system under you know a, a private entity to do this so what we have is the government to go in and and protect our patents and our intellectual property our inventions our copywritten work um, okay. So and they and they they do that protection using money taken from the public in the form of taxes. So we yes, need to solve it's that a, problem. It's, it's a it's a deep conversation, Dave. Let, let's get your thoughts. <laughs> well, let's let's sweep that aside by saying, well, let's get rid of the tax system and get rid of the government, and we'll just say, a private company. Should there be a private company that protects these intangible things? And I say, yeah, that's a great idea. If, if I come up with an idea and I want to run a business on it and I start my business and then some, some other guy rips my idea off and he starts running his business and I'm like, hey, uh, how do I protect my investment in this idea? And I have a private company that says, hey, we will protect your intellectual property. I say, oh, cool. So I'm paying them. What are they going to do? They're going to go to the other guy and say, hey, man. Uh, you know, this business that you're running, it looks like you ripped off Dave Scotese's idea. And, you know, they'll have a conversation. And out of that conversation, it might go to the courts. It might go to the public. 
where, you know, we start publishing. I start publishing. Yeah, I came up with this idea because this, that, and the other thing. And he starts publishing. Say, no, no, I came up with the idea because this, that, and the other. And we have the, this public debate or whatever. You know, and meanwhile, customers are coming to both of, both of us and comparing our services. And, of course, if I came up with the idea, I would assume my business is going to handle that idea a little bit better than his. And so all this publicity is going to shift his customers toward me. And so the protection is built into that that publishing remedy. And I think that's great. And I think the public would respect that and say, yeah, Dave came up with the idea. And even if, it, I mean, even if I suck at executing my idea, somebody else ripped it off and now he's trying to do it. A lot of people in the public are going to say, yeah, well, Dave's stuff's a little crappier, but, he, you know, he originally came up with it. And that's obvious from all the, discussions and stuff that the, that his protection company basically have published um so and he seems like the more honest guy so i'm going to patronize him even though his stuff isn't quite as good there's a lot of people in the public that would feel that way i think and so i'm i'm all for the protection of intellectual property i just don't like using stolen funds to do it and you know all the the laws and the legalese and the lawyer system that we already talked about. So. so you think that the free market and just the publicity will be enough to protect it? I mean, it'll it'll kind of work itself out on its own, which is interesting. I, I don't know if that's – I don't know if I totally agree with that. I, I think there's some truth to that because, I mean, if I started something and I'm just one small guy and they took my idea, let's say – a company like Walmart who has billions of dollars, you know, obviously they can market the product. They can do so much more than a small little guy like me could, even though I might have the idea and the original concept. I mean, the, the amount of intelligence they have and the amount of money they have, I assume would crush even, uh, you know, whatever publicity the public would think that oh well i was the original founder i mean it it, it, it is a deep conversation uh but it, there are people out there who think that property rights you know should be free to use like uh, stefan kinsella i mean he's a guy who's advocating for that am, am i right on that i believe uh, yeah i think so i think uh stefan kinsella's position is that the use of um, no, I'm mixing his position with mine. I tried to. I've had a comment discussion with him about this on uh, voluntarius.com, where this issue is explored in depth. There's actually a section called um, "Property and Ideas" or just "Property," um, and he, he. It's pretty hard to nail him down on. What I concluded, which is that he and I agree fundamentally, you know, on the idea that you shouldn't use government force for anything, even if it's intellectual property. Um, and his view of the idea of intellectual property is all about government. So he has to reject it. And I get that. I would have to reject it, too. But as I just described, my idea of intellectual property is it's, you know, attribution and it's recognizing that the creator of an idea is most of the time the best person to improve it. And ideas are always changing. Um, but, you know, getting him to that point, it, it, it was impossible. So I'm not sure how much of what I say he agrees with. Um, but he does He does say, uh, yeah, there shouldn't be any intellectual property. And when I, when I suggested, um, no, I'm probably going to get this wrong, um, that wouldn't it, wouldn't it be satisfactory to say, if you use somebody else's idea, then you should say it was their idea. And, and that would be enough for me. Um, and he wouldn't, I don't think he agreed with that. Or he said, well, that's beside the point, or something like that. So it's, it, is a, it is a deep, deep discussion. And I think the important thing to remember is people are hurting each other because there's patent and trademark laws. I don't think people should be hurting each other. We have ideas and we could, uh, what point is there to have ideas if they end up with us hurting each other? So just, you know, come up with your ideas and stop hurting each other. And if that means we get rid of patent and trademark offices, that's great because they cost taxpayer money and they justify theft. 
Mm -hmm. So that's that's what you mean by hurting each other, because a lot of people would say that patents and trademarks are protecting the creators of an idea and allowing them to uh, fully sure operate their business and uh, not be taken over by people who are just out there who are in a better position to actually take that idea and run with it. Sure. My perspective is very Rothbardian. The, basically the government is the largest mafia and everything they do is criminal. So when you're, when you're a kidnap victim and you're locked in a cage and your kidnapper brings you food and somebody says, well, the kidnapper is feeding you. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah, it's a good thing. Should you be in a cage where you have to have food brought to you? No, you should not be. So the kidnapper is a bad guy. Even though he feeds you, he's still a bad guy. So yeah, even though the government uses some of the money that it steals from us to protect people's intellectual property, they're still bad guys. Yeah, and I think from the perspective of the person who's kidnapped, when they start identifying and sympathizing with the oppressor, that's called Stockholm Syndrome. Yes, everybody <laughs> has Stockholm Syndrome. That's a good point. <laughs> Well, Dave, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today and sharing your, your thoughts on uh, liberty and Bitcoin. And uh, is there anything else that you wanted to leave us with in terms of uh, conclusion and where people can reach out to you and learn more about you? Um, I can't think of something besides uh, my litmocracy.blogspot.com where I generally try to make a blog entry about m my most important thoughts. I also have a, a, a Bitcoin dealer newsletter. I'm trying to encourage lots of people to become Bitcoin dealers because I think that would solve a lot of problems. Um, and that, I don't, I don't have a handy way to say that except go to local Bitcoins and look up my profile and there's a link at the top to the archives of the newsletter. And that would be easy uh, on local Bitcoins. Well, there you have it, everyone. That's Dave Scotese. Dave, thanks so much for coming on the show with me today. Sure. Ken, thanks for having me.